So welcome everyone. It's nice to be here for the first panel of the conference. Um, and yeah, so please let me ask my dear panelists to the stage um, um, so I can introduce them. So maybe first come in so the, the whole audience can see you. Andreas Audrich, a member from the German Bundestag Party of the Green Party. Um, maybe you can sit next to me. Uh, Susan Demigian joining us from, from Washington, from the uh, US Trade Representative for Small Business, Market Access and Industrial Competitiveness. Hildegard Müller, a president of the German Association of the Automotive Industry, VDA. And Klaus, um, oh, you switched seats, so uh, Jörg Wohan first, advisor in the Americas. Uh, no, no, you can say, I just have to introduce you the right way. Okay, now we have uh, Klaus Michael Stahl, uh, Deputy General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation at UC, and Jörg Wohan from the European Commission joining us, uh, advisor in the Americas Directorate of the European Commission, DG Trade. Great to have you here. <laughs> So I don't want to introduce too long because uh, we're short on time, but I think there is no longer any doubt uh, looking at the, the topic of our panel, a race to the top, IRA, EU, EU Green Deal and the competition for green tech, that um, all states have industrial policy as their main, on their main agenda. And um, US having started with the IRA, um, which was a big uh, success, but now also discussing a bit the consequences, like a race for more subsidies, potentially rising debts and inflation. So I want to um, have a first very quick round so we can get to know the, the positions of the panels. Um, what measures should governments take to achieve the green transition and competitiveness of their industries? Maybe we can start from the end. And um, so what, what should governments do uh, to achieve the green transition? Yeah, good, the good thing is when I start, I can paint a broader picture. Now, at the EU level, we are convinced that we need a policy mix, and you have all followed this. And we started off from a very liberal uh, position, economically, not in the American sense, uh, uh, with emission trading system, with uh, making emissions, CO2 two emissions an economic factor, and thereby um, and nudging companies to take this into account in their economic behavior. The second uh, dimension we are following at EU level is um, the uh, regulatory approach, um, where we think we need this to ensure a level playing field between companies, something which you cannot necessarily uh, only achieve through something like the emission trading system. And then there is a third dimension, and this is a bit to what you alluded, um, it's uh, industrial policy in a broader sense. Um, and uh, it is uh, admittedly uh, triggered to a, to a certain extent through the American approach, uh, which made everybody realize in the EU that we need to do uh, more uh, on that level, but it was already there before, so you don't get blinded now by the IRA discussion. Think back to the time when uh, we prepared, prepared the uh, um, um, financial framework for the EU, so the long-term EU budget, where we factored the green transition in, all, already into our cohesion policies and into our um, research uh, program Horizon Europe, uh, where we wanted to channel all the funds in those directions. And then um, so everyone, I think uh, because oh, it's just okay. a very short first round, uh, and then we will come back to each panelist. Uh, Mr. Stahl, can you give a labor union perspective? What? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you for being here, and thank you for starting with musical shares. I thought it's, it's just to get a good overview. Also, Never for had the, that start before. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, so, so very quickly, trade union background, and and of course the the main priority for us is to ensure that we we talk about what what underpins and what's embedding uh, the green transition and, and competitiveness. And that would, of course, be, be all of the social conditions, functioning in childcare, schools, uh, public services, healthcare, uh, the fact that there are trade unions, uh, fair wages, uh, uh, and all of that. And that's seldom discussed in, in these uh, settings. And, and I think that's where, where Europe has its competitive advantage as well. So, so, so I think that's something I'm going to bring forward a lot today. And, 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 and the need for social when we talk green, uh, because without social there will be no green transition. Because it won't work. People yeah. won't support it. I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Short. Great, thank you. Ms. Müller, uh, what is your perspective? Yeah, also, just a short uh, beginning. Um, I think the... Uh, to make the location as competitive as possible. I think that's uh, the overall 
picture that we need from uh, states, uh, whether it is from Germany or from the um, European Union, that makes first to do our own homework, and then the second step should be much more treaties than we have uh, at, the, at the time. So I think we can follow up these two ideas. Right. Mr. Regen, yeah. Well, thank you, um, and thank you for having me here. I think, likewise, when you look at it from a government perspective, it is a, a broad mix of policies. Green transition is two simple words, but it actually covers a lot of different things, you know, from research and development and technical innovation to workforce development, um, you know, supporting uh, disadvantaged communities as well as our industries. So it's a whole range of policies, and I. And you know, the mix is going to depend on the economy and its industrial base and its uh, uh, transition needs. So it's hard to pinpoint, but it's, it's a, a very broad mix of domestic policies, international cooperation, trade, uh, investment. It's everything, really. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Ardrich, the German perspective. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm trying to pinpoint, as you said, uh, on maybe three points and a kind of catch-all fourth point. First, uh, investments. We are looking at changing the way how we are producing fundamentally. Each and every company will change in a very profound way, so that needs a lot of investment. Um, that is, on the other hand, uh, incentivizing private investment a lot, so both belong together. Second point is we need very clear regulation because um, uh, the clearer regulation is, the better companies know where to go and where to invest and how to invest. Um, third, uh, um, I um, would say we need uh, good conditions for people, proper wages, because people have to feel in the end that what we are doing is for their benefit. They have to have in the end a feeling that it's going to be better in future. That's a main aspect, and actually I think we neglected this a lot in Germany, and there was a time when it was neglected in the United States as well, and that's a huge problem. And my kind of catch-all fourth point is make things work more easily, less bureaucracy, uh, 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 cheaper energy prices, things like that. And Mr. Aldrich, to continue on that, you recently visited uh, Pennsylvania and West Virginia in the US, so you've seen how the IRA has played out in, in practice. Uh, what lessons did you take with you uh, for Germany? Can Germany really apply these things, given that we cannot even give tax credits uh, to our companies mm -hmm. like the US is, is doing? <laughs> Uh, we should, actually. Um, I'm very convinced that um, the way that the United States uh, uh, is going at the moment is the right way. They made a huge decision to uh, start not only looking at prices, where uh, there was a start in Europe and talked about the prices as well. It's not bad looking at prices. We need all the different m um, measures. But investing and making sure that jobs do exist and will exist more in future, that's a main thing. And I've seen, for example, um, in uh, West Virginia, um, a place, there was a um, steel company, old steel company, 12,000 people used to work there, and uh, it was about yeah. to end. Like over the last years, all these 12,000 jobs uh, um, uh, didn't exist anymore and now just as I was there two, two weeks uh, ago it was announced that it will shut down and 500 meters away from there a bat battery cell factory is built up with IRA um, uh, money and the people that I was talking to there they said they raised a certain amount of private investment, private money then there was the IRA, then there was the situation that uh, they knew it will be worth it investing and suddenly they were able to, uh, to raise a lot more private capital to, to get this uh, company going. And this is a model we need as well. We have technical problems. We just discussed a lot with our lender, with our states, um, the way how we can actually get to these tax credits. It's a pity that we didn't manage again. Um, so we Maybe are this Friday. having uh, no yeah. this Friday the Wachstumschancengesetz, this law. Uh, I hope it's going through. But um, uh, without that mechanism, we were fighting a lot for it. But in the end, um, I'm not blaming anybody. I could, but I'm actually <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow. Um, uh, for the moment, it's a pity that we don't have this. But at least on Friday, yes, we have to get this uh, law going uh, to uh, do something for the economy. Yeah. 
Maybe Ms. Miller, I can, uh, because you were looking a bit uh, <laughs> interested in the arguments, uh, would you, you share the viewpoints? Is there not a danger of a, a subsidies raise if we continue the points that Mr. Aldrich uh, just made, if we just copy the things in Germany? Uh, at the beginning, I come to some other conclusions, because uh, I think what the, common, the economy is not needed is more regulation to have a, have a framework. We have enough regulation, you have enough bureaucracy and regulation and so on. And the IRA, for me, the fascinating point of the IRA is that the states is looking for the, for the root causes, for the overall conditions companies need to be competitive as possible. And then they are, they are technology open. The overall game is to reduce CO2, the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, whatever is possible that can be done. Here in Germany and Europe, we are uh, much more regulated with technologies. I think that's it's not an impact for the green tech we can develop. The, um, for, the, for example, the automotive industry will invest in the next four years 280 billion euros in research, new technologies, and so on. And uh, the wider the possibilities are, the more green tech we can develop and the more green tech we can develop for different uh, solutions in the world because the world is also on, on different points. And that's I really support in the IRA. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's not the tax credit. It's also a point. But I think when you look at... And, look how competitive we are here with, with the United States. For example, just look at the energy prices and there we support and, uh, the Wachstumschancengesetz, but there's only a drop in the, in the ocean we need to be open. When the energy prices, for example, are up to three to five times higher here than in the United States. And then I can continue with other um, uh, framework and conditions. That's what I mean with root cause, with, with the problems we have. We, have. we don't need support with a subsidy for one company. We need a Competitive framework uh, to to be um, to yeah to stay here in Europe to stay in, in in Germany in a world that's really globalized. What I criticize at the IRA, I mean we we talked a lot about this, is the protectionistic elements, and that I really underline what the ambassador said. But um, the relations are not so good as they could be. So we have to come back to um, uh, to the question what we are doing now with the TTC, for example, and so on. Coming back to a really uh, to a really joint forces also. Yeah. Just jump in with the yeah. protectionist element yeah. that you were saying. Do you mean there that the tax credits for electric vehicles are not applied to, to German uh, co companies, for example? Yes, or? for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh, the, the domestic standards we have and so on. And that I, I'm convinced that um, uh, this is a barrier. It's, um, it's um, not, not a kind of free trade. I mean, we had a lot of discussions with the European Union. And the answer can be other sanctions and other, so other subsidies, other sanctions... And and then it's a spiral. Um, so um, I think, especially Europe and the United States, so yeah, due to a several reason we have at the moment, also the geopolitical, the geoeconomic um, uh, perspective we have, we need urgently to work better, better together than we are at the moment. And I don't want to talk about TTIP and Chlorhinchen or whatever, but uh, the mistakes in the past shows us now that um, uh, what we have to do in the future. Mm. Um, Mr. Vujan, maybe I can hear your perspective. So Miller just said no more subsidies are, are needed. Would you agree to, to that view from the commission? I said you have to point the money in the root causes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a bit of subsidies, but not yeah. too many. Uh, how would you describe it from the commission uh, viewpoints? Uh, do you looking at subsidies, uh, speaking of um, critical industries or are you more focusing on issues like the emissions trading system where the market comes more into play? Yeah, from Ms. Müller indeed said uh, that we also need to look at the conditions, not only at the subsidies. And I appreciate that because, of course, the conditions and the level playing field, this is what we are, we are fighting for in the EU. And this is also to reply to your question about the subsidies. We have to also ensure that we have a level playing field here inside of the EU. This is one of the reasons why the EU was created, uh, to ensure that not the rich countries out-subsidize uh, the other member states. And... Um, of course, in Germany, I will then often hear the argument, if German economy is going well, everybody will be going well. Uh, but uh, this is uh, not going so well. It's a moment, little yeah. bit uh, self-centered <laughs> approach sometimes, so we have to keep an eye on that. But of course, 
uh, as I said, we come from the emission trading um, uh, system approach and we still hold to this because it has proven to be very uh, effective. But we also see now that there is a need for um, state aid uh, to uh, sectors and we are uh, trying to calibrate this very intelligently. Um, we want to, uh, on the, in the first place, uh, sensitize the member states that they do not enter in such a race, and uh, secondly, to see what we can do at a European level. Uh, we're using our cohesion funds. We also su suggested now a European instrument uh, for, for uh, industrial uh, uh, transition, uh, green transition. Uh, so we have to use green. everything that's in our t uh, toolbox. You mean the Net Zero Industry Act, correct? Uh, that's uh, part of it, uh, but also STEP, um, which is um, a European instrument to um, help uh, the transition uh, of industries to greening. We don't have a lot of money at the European level for that, nothing compared to what a member state like Germany could, uh, uh, could shell out, but uh, I think that's an important first step. Mm. I want to uh, circle again a bit back to the electric uh, vehicles issue, um, just because we touched on it earlier already. Um, Mr. Mijian, uh, when Ms. Muller is uh, talking about the tax credits um, for electric vehicles, uh, was that an issue that you were thinking of when designing the program as well? How will it impact our European partners? Is it a possibility to still bring it in or is it a done deal now? That you well, cannot have it? well, first of all, the IRA was a piece of legislation and it was created by our Congress. And they determined the, the credit levels and the eligibility criteria and so forth. So now we are implementing that. And it is within the guidelines that Congress has given us. But I think focusing just on that, it does not really address the issue of, of using our industrial policy for the purposes of, of our green transition, because this is in the in a global context. This is not just a US and EU issue. It is um, a, a global issue because these are global markets. The pressures we're facing, our companies are facing, are um, with regard to global market distortions that we're trying to overcome because we will not be able to accomplish our decarbonization objectives if the companies and industries that are responsible for it um, cannot remain competitive. So. From our perspective, we need to think about this in the broader context, not just in the transatlantic context, and to see how we can work to cooperate on, on the approaches that we take so that they help our companies, whether they're in the US, in the EU, jointly across the Atlantic, um, be able to address these competitive pressures. And electric vehicles right now is a very significant one. And whether it's the US tax credit, the, e the IRA tax credit is not going to make or break how our EV industries um, evolve and, and, and remain competitive. So I think from, we would like to continue to work on, on ways to address these issues in the, in the environment that our, our companies and industries are operating in. Mm. So you were <laughs> describing the issue without mentioning the big name, uh, the, the big elephant in the room, China. Um, it's also a view that the, the China strategy is, is quite different from <coughs> Europe uh, versus uh, the US. Uh, could you maybe give us some insights again how China, uh, why is uh, the US so worried about China and um, will it change with the President Trump or will it... Uh, uh, probably most likely, <laughs> but uh, maybe give us some well, insights into the China threat. Well, I can't speak to to the election, election outcomes, but I'll say you know our our auto industries have evolved different, a little bit differently. We have we have been focused on the North American market. We have not had much Chinese penetration in the auto sector into the United States, and certainly the business plans of. U.S. companies or, North or companies operating in North America have been perhaps different than what they are in the Europe context. So in that regard, uh, the, the potential for the type of uh, 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 pressure that uh, heavily subsidized uh, Chinese electric vehicles can bring into the North American market is of concern. And, you know, the, the political environment of an election year makes, makes that an even uh, bigger focus of attention. But I think, you know, we, we face similar pressures. It may have started more, much sooner here in Europe, but I think we're facing the same problems. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, Mr. Stahl, maybe to, to bring your perspective also from a, a labor union, trade union uh, perspective, how do you think, uh, what is our competitive advantage uh, in Europe uh, when dealing with these threats from, from China and other um, uh, states that have maybe less uh, strict standards than we have? Well, so competitive advantage is the fact that we have democracy. We have freedom, we have trade unions. I think these are, are very good things to, to have when you compete on, on a global uh, scene. We have the same things in, in the United States as well. And I think that's something to, to cherish and to, to hold dear and hold close to our hearts. I was in the discussion yesterday with, with some, some business leaders and I was quite surprised to hear the willingness to embrace China uh, when it came to, 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 to the efficiency of markets. They, they make a decision and that happens. They build motorways in, in overnight and so on. Yes, all fantastic, but it's not the place to live, I think, if, if you are a worker. So, so I think there, there, there has been quite some, some na naivety around China uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think the Americans are, are, are showing that that, that, end of, uh, that period of naivety has come to an end. Certainly so with, with what happened in Ukraine mm -hmm. and, 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 and the global uh, uh, situation we are in today. So, so, so mm -hmm. I, th I think that's, that's our important elements to, to bring into the discussion uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to China. I would just ask maybe Ms. Miller because, uh, I mean, the Chinese market is very important for the, the German auto industry. And uh, would you share the, the same points that Mr. Stahl just made? Or I mean, I think nobody is naive in this question. Um, then I th secondly, I think the, the U.S. is much more related to China than we are at the end. I think uh, the, the American economy has also a lot of questions uh, due to this. For example, when you look at products coming from Mexico, China is very much investing in Mexico and, and so on and so on. So it's not only the, the naive Europe that's uh, looking only at the markets there. Uh, the, the third thing is, uh, it depends a bit, is uh, China just a production facility or is it also a consumer market? I mean, to be open, from the consumer market, the 1.4 uh, uh, a billion Chinese people, we earn the money that we can invest in the tradition. We don't, uh, uh, at the moment, it's not possible to earn the money, for example, in the European market. We are still in the market development under 2019, uh, uh, before the COVID pandemic situation and so on. So when you want an economy that's investing money, you have also to look for consumer markets. Um, the fourth thing, I think it's, uh, is it better non-negotiations and non-trade or is it better to have trade and have relations with country? Um, I think, uh, um, and, and I, I underline not to be naive, I know this, uh, the Silk Belt project, I know everything, but uh, uh, when we want to be competitive, when we want to handle it, then at first of all, we have to do our own homework. And I think at the end, to, begin, to be in a better position to negotiate with China, we have firstly to do a lot of questions we have here in Europe. And we have, for example, in uh, working close together between the, um, the United States and Europe. And then the IRA, the protect protectionistic element of the IRA are not helping. Because the bigger the uh, power is we, we can bring together, the better uh, are our conditions to uh, negotiate with China, for example. And mm. so it's not an only yes or no question, do you want to invest in China or not? What is with the, with the discussion from the European Union we want to have? Uh, all the discussions are stopped, for example, at the, uh, the question how we can yeah, discuss about the, the um, 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 Investitionsabkommen, mm -hmm. the investment yeah, uh, the, agreement. The, yeah, the investment agreement. Be, yeah. So there are no, no negotiations at the moment. I think that's a problem and also uh, that we have to... Uh, well, if the begin. Chinese ban half of our European Parliament members from entering China, it's a bit difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know everything is difficult, yeah. uh, but it's uh, not doing anything. It's not better. And the EU anti-subsidy uh, um, 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 thing we have at the moment, I think that's not the correct answer to the... Um, the mm. to the challenges you were we probably have. also hinting a bit that the, the trade agreements that are not uh, moving forward. Uh, so, Mr. Wuyan, maybe you can elaborate. Is the EU happy with this? Pro I mean, Mercosur is on hold. Uh, the trade agreement with India, I think, is on, on hold. And uh, CETA. Australia. So, <laughs> it's just... Uh, how is Specified CETA. <laughs> yeah. Is there not a danger that then again China and, and other states can jump in and, and take our 
markets away from us, potential markets. Yes, yes, I appreciate uh, Mrs. Müller's optimism. We should have agreements with China. We can't even have agreements with South America, with countries which are all democratic, which are uh, very close to Europe historically. But here we have uh, um, movements inside of the EU. We have member states who don't want these agreements. We have next, uh, no, this uh, Thursday there will be a vote in the French Senate. This is the first chamber of the French Parliament. And there is a high risk that they will vote down an existing trade agreement, the one with Canada, CETA. Mm -hmm. And for God's sake, if we can't even uh, make uh, trade agreements with Canada, with whom are we going to conclude trade agreements? A little bit indirect answer to your wish for agreements with China. So we are really um, uh, in a, in a diff difficult situation here, and the, the undercurrents in Europe are very different ones. Uh, I can only assure you and uh, reassure you that we as European Commission, we are uh, the, the standard bearers for trade agreements and we'll still continue to, to negotiate them and then put them on the table for the member states. Uh, and uh, we'll always be happy for member states who then see the advantages of these uh, trade agreements as it happened eventually with uh, CETA here in Germany. But it's not an easy task these days, uh, also inside of Europe. And... I keep telling, and we keep telling people, if you want, talking about South America, if you want to deliver uh, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and uh, Uruguay to China on a silver platter, well, go ahead. Mm. Um, Mr. Stahl, you, you, were, you were arguing before about also uh, more labor rights, probably also environmental rights. Now we're discussing this issue. Uh, what would you say, why is there still an argument to make these trade agreements uh, very big and, and combine a lot of elements in them. Is there then not the danger to what we just discussed that they will go to other other markets? So, so, so in, in our opinion, trade agreements is not only about buying and selling stuff. It's also about changing the world and, and putting pressure on, on, on a certain development, going in a certain direction. And, 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 and of course, you will get your hands dirty in that process. Uh, you will have to make compromises. I know a lot about compromises. <laughs> I've been doing them my whole life uh, as a negotiator. Uh, but there are certain things that need to be, 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 be sacred, holy. And, and, and that's where I think that naivety comes into the play. We thought we could change China. But I think China has, 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 has changed us more than we have changed China. So, so now it's time for us to, to, to become much bolder uh, in how we negotiate. That doesn't mean that we have to put all of our agreements on hold, but, but, but it is a way to push for change. But just one comment, without any trade agreements, our influence on climate protection, on human rights, on whatever we want, is zero. So when we don't have any trade agreements, like Mercosur, like CETA, like whatever, uh, then our influence uh, uh, on, on the on other region is zero. So maybe it's better to start to step with 50 or 80 percent even if they are 20 percent, I mean, Mercosur, yeah, that's agriculture. Uh, uh, Mexico, that's energy, and so on. In everywhere is some point, but we want to fulfill a 150 percent perfect trade agreement. We will fail, at, uh, in my opinion. So we have to learn to be quick, to start, to build up trust, to to negotiate with other countries, to be in deeper relations. And in a world that's changing so rapid, time is really urgent, uh, one of the main points. And for example, when, when you look at the negotiations with Mexico, I mean, we have elections, they have elections. So when I was there, I said, yeah, it stopped for one year. So, yeah. but China is not stopping negotiations with Mexico for one year. Yeah, Mr. Mija, maybe you can give a view from <laughs> the transatlantic perspective. You now heard how we have troubles in, uh, in Europe, right, so moving forward. Uh, why, what would you say to, to, I don't know, Mr. Macron or other people that are now uh, holding up uh, the trade agreements, uh, why it is so important to conclude them uh, to... Uh, Mr. Mijan, sorry, just oh. because you, um, you, you have, a, I think, more um, tougher view on China, right? Yeah. Also on the threat of China from the US. Yes, and as you know, uh, trade agreements are, are not our primary form of trade engagement at uh, in the United States these days, but that doesn't mean that there's no other way to address some of these issues. We do have engagements in the Asia Pacific, the Western Hemisphere, because other countries 
are, are also looking for ways to not be dependent on China. Um, and the ways to do that is to foster environments that support investment from the United States and from Europe and an and understanding of the standards that we need and uh, the expectations that we have um, in order to be uh, compatible trade partners, but also so that our companies feel comfortable investing and moving their supply chains from China and Asia into other countries in in. Latin America, uh, Asia, and Africa. And, um, you know, I think it's, it, it takes a certain level of understanding, a, a commitment to engagement to be able to do that. And, it, and just because we don't have a signed legal document uh, does not mean that we can't make progress in those areas because I think we do share a lot of similar interests and, uh, and there's a lot to work with. So we, we have found those engagements to be very valuable and we continue them with, uh, with the Western Hemisphere, in Africa and in, in Asia. And um, you know, we have a very robust agenda with each of those areas on, on these very issues. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, let's move the topic, uh, the discussion maybe again to another uh, area of focus, uh, the solar industry. I thought it's also a good uh, area to, to discuss because their US policies also impacted Germany uh, quite a lot. And Mr. Uh, Audrey, you are involved in the solar package discuss, uh, um, debating how the German state can maybe aid the German solar industry. Um, we just uh, heard that Maya Burger, I think they closed the factory and uh, have to mm. let go of 500 people. So it's not looking uh, too good uh, on the solar industry. Can the German state give some hope to these companies? Or, or? Um, the solar industry is a very good example for many things that we just heard and that we were discussing. We actually started the whole thing in uh, uh, Germany here, um, bringing up the solar industry. And now we are 99% dependent on China when it comes to the solar industry. And something must have happened on the way that is just wrong. Yeah. Like, there is no other solution to this question. And um, yes, I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's very good to clap on that because... Uh, that's the same situation we see in many other parts of economy. If we are not investing in heating systems here in Germany, in heat pumps and other modern technologies, these technologies will be gone. It's as hard as that. China will produce. And if we are not investing in electro vehicles in Europe, the industry will be gone because China is investing. They are doing strategic decisions. They have the question in mind, who will be leading in the 21st century? And they combine a power play on the one hand to an econo economy question on the other hand and climate technology on the third question. And they made the decision coming back to the solar industry to at the, in a, on, at the moment when we in Germany said, okay, we are withdrawing subsidies for the solar industry when they were growing. They went into that uh, and they invested billions. And the, so, uh, the solar industry will be bigger worldwide than the car industry in the future because on each and every roof there will be solar uh, uh, energy. In Africa, in Asia, wherever. And this economy is rising. And we are dependent 99% on China. And that's where there comes something in that the United States did. The United States at a certain point said, we are doing a directive uh, uh, concerning um, uh, um, um, like child labor and, um, and forced labor. And they said, that's why we are not taking in solar panels from China anymore. The result is that all these panels are going to Europe and that our markets are destroyed and they are destroyed on purpose and by China. And that's why also I'm coming back to the question that we were talking about taking strategic decisions and always saying we are just doing everything. Technology is open. We are not taking any decisions. Will lead to 
the loss of the power play with China will lead that we are not having the technology here, will lead that we are not having wealth here, will lead that we are not having the jobs here that we need, and will lead in the end that our democracy is going to collapse because that's what people need. They, they need jobs, they need wealth, they need all of that. And so the question that coming back like to, coming back, coming back to this, we have to dare as politicians to take decisions, and that's the problem over the last 15, 16, 17 whatever years, um, that in Germany there was no decision taken. And when I'm, for example, coming back to the car industry for one second, when we are talking about that in 2035 there won't be fossil combustion engines in Europe anymore, and this is questioned now, leaders of German big car companies are trying to get appointments in my office and we are sitting there in my small office and they are begging me not to let it happen that this is drawn back again because they are saying they're investing billions now. They're going for it all over, uh, uh, over Europe because they want to take on that competition. So we need to have clear regulation. I think regulation. what you're describing, and, Mr. And, Andrich, and but I have to, to jump in because yeah, we have limited solar, solar, time and <laughs> uh, we need to hear the other panelists solar, as well. Solar industry, just one sentence. We are negotiating. We are not done yet, but it's a struggle. And you haven't even told me, uh, unfortunately, so, if you have the subsidies or not, because so it's still in we, discussion. We, we started with uh, a program for the solar industry already that uh, um, uh, goes into the production side. Um, but yes, we have a problem in, on the demand side. That is uh, a problem because when we have this, the solar panels, panels coming in under the production price. It's, it's, it's cheaper than production yeah, price. I think we understand. But so the, then we, need, the, then the we need to do something for the demand side, and that's the struggle that we're having in the government at the moment. But I think what we heard now from your uh, talk as well is the problem that everyone tries to, to save their industry, tries to save their job. So uh, is that not maybe to a question to all of the, uh, the whole panel, um, a problem? Like everyone tries to keep their industry at home, keeps the job at home, so how then can we be cooperating uh, if everyone is just trying to save their own solar industry, their own electric vehicle industry? Um. I mean, we learned, especially in Germany and Europe, we learned that international trade is, uh, and international um, supply chains are the... Yeah, are responsible for the welfare we had in the past. And 70% of the jobs in Germany in the automotive industry are linked to export. So it's a really a so difficult situation we are sitting on. We will build 50 million cars until 2030. Uh, but where do, we, where do we build them and who will sell them? And uh, because uh, at the end of the day, when we don't have a charging infrastructure that the consumer wants, they won't, bow, they won't uh, uh, buy these cars. For example, that whole Greece has, uh, um, oh, no, better say Hamburg has double as public charging infrastructure than the whole Greece. So um, it's far away from reality for the people to stand over. So we produce these cars and they are standing still at the moment because the people are not convinced that in their lives, Life circumstances we have, it's possible to charge the cards. That's the That's reality, good. for example. And once again, but where do we where, where do we build these cars? I mean, 70% of the jobs are linked to expert. At the moment, more and more investments are going out of Germany because our location is not competitive in every question. So, and that's not uh, unpatriotic or something to say this, it's a reality. I mentioned the energy costs, and I can continue with a lot of other factors who are responsible for the question, where do we have to invest now? I said well, that we invest 280 billion euros in the next four years and we need decisions and we need from the current government decisions and not looking what happened in the past good or bad or whatever we now need the decisions from the government to make uh, Germany as competitive as possible and this the Wachstumschancengesetz is only as I mentioned small. a really small yeah, point right, yes. in, yeah. every, in every important question the government in itself has not the same opinion of what it's doing and that's a problem right now we have mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Mr. Media, and maybe uh, before we open it up soon to the to audience, because I'm sure they want to ask their questions as well to, to all of you. Um, so what would you say, Mr. Media, how to align the policies better between the US and Germany? Because we just touched on it. It's having huge impacts on each other's markets. Well, 
our systems are very entrenched and they've developed over decades. So we're not going to be doing the same thing the same way. Um, it's, it's not going to be possible. But I think, you know, as the ambassador was talking about earlier, the, we need areas of cooperation. Right now we are working with the Trade and Technology Council, which has a number of working groups that are trying to find areas where we can align what we do so that we can reduce the burdens and costs um, of our uh, of our programs and, and our um, intentions, um, and also uh, find joint responses. Because again, the issue that we're dealing with is, is a global uh, market and a global trade environment. And the way that we can counteract the, um, the influence that China's uh, market distorting policies have had is for us to work in an alignment, not only together, but with others, because we need an equal amount of market power to be able to, um, to make the changes we need and to keep and to sustain them. Because it's one thing to, to support the infrastructure development and everything that we're doing in the United States, but we all, our companies will want to know that, that they will remain competitive and that they will be able to continue to operate in the global market um, over the longer term. And I think that is what we're trying to do in TTC, is to find these areas. They're, some of them are very technical. They're not you know, things Easy you put up in lights. to the public. Um, and, uh, but they will hopefully be, make a difference so that we can maintain the same objectives and work towards them and not think of this as a, just a bilateral co competitive environment, but one where we can both benefit. Great. Thank you for uh, explaining that. And uh, could we open it up to the, to the audience? So are there questions from the audience to our panel? If you could maybe introduce yourself and uh, like sure. from which industry My name is, from. I'm not from an industry. I'm in academia at Queen's University in Canada, but currently... You can stand at, up if at, you want, yeah. I'm currently at Free University of Berlin. I just wanted to, um, there, there was a fascinating discussion. One thing that re didn't really came out was the trade-offs between jobs on the one hand and the speed of the green transition on the other hand. And there I wanted to push back a bit against you, uh, Mr. Aldrich, because he said we need the solar industry, we need these jobs. Yeah. But isn't China doing us a massive favor by subsidizing solar panels, driving down the, pr the price of solar panels? We have lots of jobs in solar installation. And I didn't really see you grappling with that challenge of, on the one hand, it's helping us to get to um, renewable energy much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And the, yes, we don't have a, a solar industry in that sense, but but isn't it worth it if really we need to achieve our climate targets? Yes, Mr. Aldridge, do you want to respond? I, I, I can, yeah. Um, it, it's a very interesting question because you're right. And uh, we do need cheap panels. That's why we are going a different way that, uh, than the United States. Uh, we are not saying we are keeping these panels out because we, we want these cheap panels here because we want to put them on our roof. And at the moment, we see the rise of uh, solar panels uh, in Germany. Ex it, it's exploding. We are really uh, building a lot of clean energy at the moment, solar, wind. Um, it's going to, through the rooftop. So, yes, we need this. But if we end... In, uh, after a few years, at a point when, where we are not able to produce anything anymore here, then we are in big trouble. And if we, we look at the other branches, talking to people about the steel industry, they tell, some people tell me, we can buy this from abroad, no problem. We don't have it here anymore, but we can buy this from abroad. And if you go further, if you talk tonight, I'm, I'm meeting... Um, the, the chemie industry, che chemical industry, chemical, chemical the chemical uh, industry. So, I want the chemical industry to be here, and I want the steel industry to be here, and I want the car industry to be here, and I want the solar industry to be here, because we need the jobs here, and we need the, the wealth in the end here. So, that's why I'm saying I'm not keeping out solar panels from China because we need the cheap. Pi uh, cheap panels here, but we need to do something about the situation that we need to have industry in Germany, that we need to have industry in Europe. And then we can either say on the one hand, last sentence, all right, I'm talking about, I'm in academia, in academia and I'm talking about an ideal world, competition worldwide and no problems. 
but it's just a lie, and we have to be clear on that. There is power play in this world, and there is unfair behavior in this world, and we have to react to this. Otherwise, we are as naive as Germany has been for years concerning Russia. 55% of gas Boyan came from Russia, and we saw what happened. We shouldn't make this happen give again. Give the perspective from the uh, European view as well, right? Uh, that it's not as easy... As exactly. I, I would subscribe to this. Unfortunately, you said the R word already, and I thought this this the was R the thinking. Russia. The thing, Russia. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yes. this, this was the thinking until. Um, Thank you. Exactly. Well, I think the the <laughs> last. I thought essentially the last person in Europe understood it uh, when the Russians second time invaded and cut the gas or we had to cut the gas everybody in this country was relying on cheap gas cheap Not gas everybody. was yeah there's some, differences in political parties and opinions and what we said agreed uh, but many people um, um, uh, built on the cheap gas because of this thinking and i thought everybody in, has understood that this is not reality anymore we have to come uh, to our senses here, we have to think in terms of economic security. We have to uh, be sure that we don't make ourselves again completely dependent on one country. And uh, that's uh, why I can only second what you're saying. And this is what we're trying at European level. Whether we always do exactly the right thing at the right time, this is a different dis discussion. But I think this is the underlying realization we have to make. Mm. But then there was another just one, one sentence. Then Very we, quick. Our, and our interest is must be to, to uh, support and empower the WTO. And I wish, for yes. example, also from our American friends to support this idea to, to empower the, um, the standards and the possibilities there. I mean, we all know the problems, but that's not the solution at the end. And I think it's, it's worth to, to empower our uh, activities in that question. Great. I saw another question, two questions. Um, maybe the, the <coughs> gentleman there in the fourth row. I think the microphone is coming. Um, Günther Tau from the company TBS. We are talking about the past and the present, you know, so regarding solar industry. But we have to even to talk about the future. Mm -hmm. You know, we are here in the, in the Baden-Württemberg. It's not only the motor automotive industry, it's a machinery industry. Mm -hmm. And I think we are missing a chance if we are not looking on robotics. You know, I think yesterday it was in the FSZ that maybe 2024 will be the year of robotics. I don't know what the Chinese are doing there. Mm -hmm. But when I see, for example, you know, Tesla in uh, Greenheide, you know, they are, it's complete, no, nearly completely automatic, so far as I've seen it from the outside. And we have still these strengths. And so what will you do, you know, for the future for these industries? Um, I just want to give also maybe to Mr. Stahl uh, perspective. How do you answer to this question also from a labor first union perspective? What to so do with robots? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then maybe also from, from, another, from the panel. Well, yeah. uh, something connects with cars uh, is, is, is a very famous uh, situation that happened in the United States in the 1950s when, when, when the trade union leader was showed around a factory and the, 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 the car maker was very proud over his factory and how he cut down costs and could lay off workers and, and, and it was all very fantastic. But he had one simple question, who's going to buy your cars? Yes. And, and, and uh, I think that comes then, what we come to here is, is technological development and, and it happens all the time. I think in that sense, green transition is, is just uh, another transition in, in many ways, uh, but it is a very important one. And this change will, will have profound uh, uh, challenges to, to our societies. And I want to, 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 to end my contribution here with a quote from a, a, a Swedish uh, trade unionist at the time, and he was also an economist, went up to OECD later on, but he said that one has to change to, to choose between the safety of the shell or the safety of the wings. And, 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 and as we go about these changes that we're having now, I, I would very much uh, like to, to make sure that we don't uh, force people into the safety of the shell. Uh, because they will defend themselves, they will defend their jobs, they will defend themselves against robots, uh, and they will not be able to buy any cars. Uh, but if you provide people with the safety of the wings, they're going to embrace the future, they're going to gonna buy cars, they're going to be optimistic, and, 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 and I think that's also important now, looking for how we talk about the future. Is the future open or is it closed?
Mm -hmm. I would like us all to, to, to agree that it's much better to be in a place where the future is open. Yeah. But still, thanks for the question because it's an important issue as well. I just want to take one more uh, or two more questions because we're slowly running out of time. So maybe the gentleman uh, next to the door was the first one. Yes, uh, my name is Jürgen Zottler. Uh, I'm research fellow at the Global Center for Economic uh, for uh, Development in Washington. Before I was executive director at the World Bank and director general at the ministry here. Uh, BMZ. And uh, I would like to say a word on uh, um, on uh, technological neutrality, because it's it's so much discussed. And um, couldn't when when we look back at what happened with the German automotive um, industry, uh, couldn't one argue that there was not enough? Uh, guidance from public policy, because we were in a way sleepwalking into that dire situation uh, we are now in. If there had been a little bit more of guidance and perhaps industrial policy, uh, then perhaps we could have avoided uh, this uh, problem. And then also, isn't it a myth, this whole thing about uh, neutrality? Uh, there are figures saying that there's a heavy bias uh, in uh, policy in favor of fossil fuel industry. So perhaps it's a myth and uh, we shouldn't really use this, these arguments in, in such a way. Could you uh, maybe say who you're targeting your question to, yeah. or would you, yes, you would, would like the comment? Like, uh, uh, I, mean, I just can give a, Müller, <laughs> two I just comments can give a, a short neutrality. comment to a long story, but uh, I, agree, I disagree really. I'm really supported from the from the possibility of electromobility, and that's a solution, for example, for the European market. If we are not only have cars, if we have also a charging infrastructure and much more, but it's certain not the only solution for the whole world. And when we want to reform. Uh, mobility and so on, there may be other technologies, for example, fuel cells or something like this. And so I disagree completely. I think it's not on the politics to make the a competitive decision for, for companies. You can fail as company, but uh, uh, to, to make the, the corridor so small, that brings us not enough solutions for the world. Mr. Voya, just uh, you were shaking your head. I saw it. <laughs> Maybe just very quick answer. Not up to me. <laughs> Not up to you. Uh, but the no, you see the Euro no, no. The <laughs> European uh, policy on this is very clear. 2035. Um, end of the combustion engine and there are many good arguments and this would be a new discussion which we don't want to open here. Um, yeah. Okay, but different different opinions, of course. Um, a last question to the gentleman in the in the front here. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Ralf Lange. I'm coming from uh, Hamburg. And um, my question is, may sound a bit or sound a bit delicate, because I haven't heard it so far anywhere. But um, given the current geopolitical shifts we see, also on security, I still miss the debate. And I have seen now the move of the European Union probably appointing a commissioner for defense industry. Where is the discussion in Germany about defense and security business? Because we know we have massive opportunities between the continents, Europe, and I'm, if I compare the budget for the economic development policy they're currently writing in Germany, about four billion, I think it's peanuts, combined with the opportunity of the defense business, which is massive all over Europe, I'm missing this debate. Thank you. Yes, um, so I guess we need our German speakers either. Maybe first Ms. Müller and then Mr. Aldrich. I, I, I really support it. In our ESG targets, it's not possible to finance um, uh, 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 because it's not sustainable. Maybe at the end of the day, it can be one of the sustainable investments we can do to uh, have a, a defense industry that uh, is able to protect us uh, against uh, aggressors. And Mr. Aldrich, maybe a very quick... Yes, uh, for us Greens, it was always easy to